Will you, internship team, with your leadership, hold our congregation to these same promises? We will. We will. Will you lead boldly and with purpose so that we all know how to be in right relationship with intern Antonia? We will. Uh, if you will, please say we will. We will. <laughs> Intern Antonia, thank you for your commitment to serving as a Unitarian Universalist minister. It's not easy, folks. It takes a lot of commitment. Thank you for listening to your call. Thank you for having enough faith in us to trust us as your teaching congregation and to trust me as your supervisor. Will you, in turn, Antonia, give generously of your wisdom and compassion, trusting us to do our work as you trust us to shape your ministry? I will. Will you help us to live our mission and to live towards our vision? I will. Will you be present in heart, mind, and spirit? I will. Then we, right now, you all up here, join some hands. And if you will reach out a hand, we enter into this commitment with humility and conviction. May we remain wide awake and never forget the sanctity of this relationship. Amen. And let the people praise.
day, I could choose to sort through the 649 emails that Google thinks I should look at, or I could choose to do something else. When I picked up my phone a few nights ago, I had 49 text messages and 18 voicemails. I'm not telling you this to confess my obviously lackluster performance in answering the emails, text messages, and voicemails. It isn't me bragging about how popular I am. It's an illustration of how many small pieces of information that I'm exposed to before I leave my bedroom. And I bet I'm not the only one with this problem. These distractions add to, add to social media, the news, work assignments, other appointments, volunteer committees, and such put us in a quandary of deciding what deserves our attention. If you're like me, you try to divide your attention through pressing appointments on your calendars and the pressing appointments of your friends and family's daily lives. Even those of us who are living alone have urgent matters that need to be attended to expeditiously, and every one of them can feel like they should be the first in line. The sheer volume of things that we are being asked to commit to can be overwhelming. Some of us use mindfulness techniques to improve our focus and our attentiveness. Some of us make a list to control our calendars and keep things in order. And some of us commit to making one section of our lives the most important priority and sticking to that commitment. Some of us do all of those things and probably a few others that I haven't even mentioned. I choose to commit to one section of my life and focus all other information through that commitment. My commitment is to my family. And sometimes when I make this claim in my mind, I hear the record scratch like, ah! <laughs> And that internal critic that lives in my head scoffs and says, yeah, right. <laughs> Partly that record scratches because I've been the person in our time for all ages who's not paying attention to the other person. I know it's awful. <laughs> I remind myself that if a child that I care for consistently receive distracted focus from me, that their experience would teach them that I'm not interested in what they think. I'm not interested in what they experience. That understanding of caregiving shapes the way that the child grows to view what attention is, what caregiving means, and how to interact with each other. Right, I mean, I know what I think about. I feel sad because I can't tell you how many times in my case to give attention to the task in front of me, that I have behaved just as that parent and shrugged off the attention and connection that my children were seeking. In speaking about love of her life, the love of her life, Mary Oliver wrote that she learned from watching her interact with people that attention without feeling is only a report. An openness and empathy was necessary if the attention was to matter. I want my children to know that I am open to them and that I am empathetically and excitedly waiting to be brought into their world. Remember that record scratch? <laughs> Partly my record scratches because I had a serious test of these values when I decided to accept this position as your intern minister. Many of you know that I live in Montclair for a good portion of the week and back home in Delaware for the rest of the week. Some of you know that my son is living in Georgia right now to go to school with my sister and my daughter is living at home in Delaware with a bevy of people taking her to activities and checking in on her. My wife works second shift at a children's hospital and we just got our six-year-old granddaughter to care for while our father is serving in the army. Life is hectic for my family. And if you're someone who's loved another person, you probably can imagine that I'm feeling some guilt about this whole setup. On paper, it was excellent and well-reasoned. However, the execution of said plan was much more difficult than I imagined. I wasn't prepared for the 
level of guilt and shame that I felt in sending my son away and not being there for every moment of my daughter's junior year in high school. Somewhere, I've internalized the idea of what a good parent is, and this arrangement didn't fit into my good parenting ideas. In her book, Spilling the Light, Reverend, Reverend Teresa I. Soto wrote, combining your worth with your results is something like using the sheet music for Beethoven's Fifth Symphony to make an apple pie or build a doghouse. There is no way for the question to resolve in a final answer. And she's right. When I started to assess my worth by a notion of good or bad, based on what I thought parenting should be, I was setting myself up to be in a continuous loop of guilt and shame. My truth was that attention was a hallmark of my parenting, and I didn't know how I was going to be able to continue to give that attention if my children weren't physically present. I didn't know how I was going to be able to put my family first. Now, now someone has to be thinking, put your family first is all well and good for someone who has a healthy family, or a family at all. But it doesn't work for all of us. Some of our families have disowned us or distanced themselves from us. Some of them live with us, and they are toxic. Some of us are the last surviving people in our family. Some of us have never even known what it was to have a family. How can family come first? In my definition of family, I'm talking about those people with whom you've chosen to be the core support of your life. These people can be biologically related, related through relationship, and related through affiliation. There is no one way to have a family. I believe that the priority of focus, focusing our attention on the people who help to keep us surviving is the only way to leave us space and capacity to focus or pay attention to anything else. When we lead with the question, how does this action, this meeting, this phone call or appointment aligned with my goal to focus, focus first on my family, it becomes pretty easy to cut through the noise of all the other distractions that demand our attention. Attention is often mixed with focus, yet we can often focus on someone without actually seeing the person, without actually seeing the fullness of who they are. Attention is taking the time to focus and see. It is seeing that comes without judgment. It is the attending to the fullness of the person. Attention tells you to be with someone. It tells you to stand grounded in the interaction. It tells you to suspend the desire to project what the future of the interaction will be and sit right now, right in the now of it. Attention, as William James would state, is the basis of your experience. In a study conducted by the NYU Medical School, they determined that what we experience in the past fills in the picture of what we see in the future. Imagine if each of us learned how valuable it was to pay attention to those we love, and we applied that filter to everything else we saw. In making my decision to see my opportunities to pay attention to the task through the lens of family, I became more aware of how local, national, and global issues are linked. They are interconnected in simple ways, such as, I want my children to live on a street it doesn't have trash and debris lying about. Therefore, I put my attention into building a new civic association, reporting dumping to my county representative, and picking up the trash. The issues can also be more complex, such as I want my family to have access to a public school that 
that meets the needs of all of the children that attend. So I will not opt out. I will not send my children to private school. I will work on education reform and work at a community level to organize parents to provide a parental advisory board and to seek that education reform. The connections that we make to our families start, start the very beginning of our interdependent web. It builds attentive connections across our entire planet. Imagine if Mary Oliver's notion of attention is true. She writes that attention is the beginning of devotion. Love simply isn't possible without deep noticing. And noticing deeply seems to inevitably lead to love. What a beautiful way of noticing the world. This type of noticing gives us an opportunity to come back into covenant with each other when we fail to pay attention. It is important not only to pay attention to our good deeds, but also to our misdeeds in our own families and friendships. This practice will prepare us for the many, many misdeeds that we'll make in the larger world. Reverend Teresa Isoda writes, I am not prepared to hear you say one thing and watch you do another without even mentioning it. I'm not talking about small mistakes. You know, we all make those. Sometimes we speak too soon and think too little. We worry more about procedures than promises, and we let fear and guilt keep our choices and actions small. Those things, common and human, keep us calling forward to different, better choices. Even in our errors, I know that the same me that lacked attention in those moments is the same me that can call out those moments empathetically and seek forgiveness for my misdeed. When we have shaped an experience of making a hurtful mistake and correcting that mistake at that moment, we are much more likely to allow ourselves the humility that we need and the grace that we seek for our public misdeeds. We know that when we practice how to treat the world and how we choose to treat the others closest to us, we know that our experiences are shaped by what we pay attention to and how we choose to respond to it. Let us remember to respond in love. Let us respond in ways that recognize the needs in others as an opportunity to express our love. Let us respond, as Mary Oliver writes, by loving them, truly them, which requires noticing your needs and then putting them down. It asks you to look out without expectations of who you want or hope they will be, and instead to try to focus simply on who they are right now. Let us meet the needs of ourselves and others with compassion, grace, and attention.